I have some Cowboys over and under reactions. You're going to tell me. And the Tolos out there, 877-881-1053 is the truckwreck.com text line. Play along with us and uh, let us know what you're thinking here. I have a few topics, uh, some based off of yesterday's game, some kind of based off of the culmination of the whole season up to this point. You're going to tell me either overreaction or underreaction. So basically, fact or fiction. What do you think? We're going to start off kind of based on yesterday. We talked about it in the previous segment. The run defense is starting to improve. So overreaction, underreaction. The run defense is finally being fixed. Um, I know it's a work in process, so I'm not going to say it is fixed, but it is being fixed. If you hold Saquon Barkley to under 50 yards, come on. Yeah. Come on. I think they're doing some things. Now, that may also have something to do with the New York Giants raggedy offensive line with backups playing most of those starting positions. But at the same time, I don't, I'm not saying it's fixed permanently because they're not built that way. The Cowboys, they're just not built that way. They're built to sack quarterbacks. And until they uh, have some guys that are run stoppers, now they got some guys in the middle there that can stop the run a little bit, Hankerson. And Hankins. Yeah, Jonathan Hankins, who yeah. they acquired uh, yeah, from the Vegas he's, Raiders. He's big butt run stopper, but that's not where the guys have been running. These these runs have, on these other teams have been around the edges. And Philadelphia on Christmas Eve is going to tell all. But at the same time, I would say they're doing better. I'm not going to say it's fixed. I'm going to say they're doing better. Okay, yeah. I would say overreaction. I think it's small sample size so far. You you really yeah, string something together. Yeah, you got to string a few of these things together. I mean, you saw early success against the Vikings uh, shutting down the run, but I think you could also point that towards the Vikings feeling like they had to do too much in the past game. It felt like they were putting the ball in Kirk Cousins' hands a little bit too much. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, feeling like they had to use their receivers when really Cowboys have one main weakness on defense, and it's the run game. They didn't attack that weakness, and then, you know, we talked about it earlier that Daniel Jones is a dynamic threat. He's a dynamic athlete. You know, he might not be the best passer in the world. He's got a good deep ball, but he can run. And Saquon Barkley, you know, he's leading the league in rushing up to this point. So shutting him down is really a good start if you can string together some more success. And guess who you have coming up next? The Colts. You have the Colts. And guess who they have? Jonathan. Jonathan Taylor and the fighting Jeff Saturdays are going to come to AT&T Stadium. But, you know, that, that's a hopeless team, but they've got a really premium running back there that really doesn't matter what their record says. they got a good player that can go off at any time, so if you can shut him down, that's when I'm going to feel a little bit more better about this run defense. What's your next one? Next question, Cowboys overreaction, underreaction. Ezekiel Elliott had 93 rushing yards, one touchdown, pretty mm -hmm. solid game outperformed Tony Pollard. Tony Pollard definitely had those uh, chunk plays, those juice plays, mm -hmm. uh, a couple first downs, you know, imperative plays. Uh, but overreaction or not, I'm going to say the team is better with Zeke on the field. I think they're better than with Tony Pollard. Is that what you're saying? No, the, the team is just a better team when Zeke is playing. When he's playing well. When he's playing, period. I'm not going to say playing I'm gonna well. Say, I I'm think gonna, that's too easy. Okay, you know what? Don't let me answer the question because I think they are, but nobody wants to hear my opinion of it. Dak Prescott, I asked him while he was on the podium yesterday about watching some vintage Zeke. Uh, he, we got some vintage Zeke with those 92 yards. Dak Prescott elaborated why Zeke is more important than just a 92-yard performance that reminded us of like Zeke from a couple of years ago. I mean, that's Zeke, uh, vintage or not. I mean, to me, that's Zeke every every week, a guy that'll do anything that's that he needs to do to uh, help this team win, um, whether it's pass protection, whether it's running, whether it's the dirty work, being physical. Um, I saw a quote, Zach Martin said he's the epitome of this team, and Boom. I definitely believe that. Just with his uh, physical play style, his willingness to do anything. Um, he's a brother of mine, uh, obviously blessed to come in and be with him these last seven years. I joked with him later in the game and said, you got you got Ferg jumping over people, man. You're an inspiration to guys. And he laughed. I'm like, we're seven deep. You know what I'm saying? You should take that as a compliment. So uh, he's um, no surprise when Zeke does Zeke things. See, this is what's wild. It's kind of like people are underestimating what Zeke Elliott brings to the team based on his carries, based upon how many yards he's getting, based on the fact that he doesn't have that same burst. It reminds me of back in the 90s. This is for reference because I cannot tell you enough how so many reporters 
and fans, because they would read what the reporters wrote or what they heard on the radio or, or saw on television, they would say, whose team is this? Is this is this, is this this uh, Troy Aikman's team? No, it's Emmett Smith's team. They go back and forth, Troy and Emmett. And I said, this is Michael Irvin's team. And they're like, there's no wide receiver that can be a dominant. No, it's, it's, it's Troy Aikman's team. He's the quarterback. No, it's Emmett Smith. He's the greatest weapon in sports because running game back then. I was like, it's Michael Irvin's team, his personality. He's the go-to guy. He fires up the locker. See, now fans, they see Michael on TV talking all the time. So now you know how Michael's dominant personality, he made the whole thing go. So you don't know what Zeke does in that locker room. You don't know. All you know is, well, he carries the ball, and he seems like an engaging guy. He's a fun guy. You see on uh, Hard Knocks, he's like a big puppy. This guy is the epitome. Zach Martin said it. Not Dak. Zach Martin, who everybody respects, right? He said Ezekiel Elliott is the epitome of this team. So my answer is, no, that's not hyperbole. What's the question? Is it? Uh, overreaction or it's underreaction? Not an overreaction. Yeah, that uh, the team is better while Zeke is playing. And they are better while Zeke is playing, and which is why he played with one leg most of the year last year. Yeah, and one leg is Zeke because they they had to have it. I think the balance that you're starting to see this offense, Kellen Moore, Mike McCarthy, produce with uh, Zeke and Tony Pollard, they're they're starting to find hold on, that hold on healthy a medium. Hold on, say we got a, tol- a couple of tolos here. Said, so come on, CA. Of course, Dak said that on the podium. Uh, 817. Dak had to say that about Zeke. That wasn't Dak saying that about Zeke. He was quoting Zach Martin, who does not have to say a word and generally doesn't. Yeah, he usually doesn't. What it is is sometimes people have, they, they want to double down on their opinion. And what Dak is telling people are facts. What Zach Martin was saying was facts. Everybody else has an opinion and they want to double down on their opinion and they're not in that locker room. So, Again, I gave the example of Michael Irvin because in the 1990s, nobody wanted to believe it. That a wide receiver could have that kind of a personality where he could dominate a team and fire them up and lift them even when Jimmy was gone. Yeah, there's uh, there's definitely, there's like a, there's an aura around Zeke. Yes, and uh, the 817 says, please don't overpay next year. I personally think that Zeke might, based on what I know about him, because I know him pretty good from the Ohio State days, he may take a pay cut. Just like a lot of people didn't think Sean Lee would take a pay cut. They just basically said, oh, Sean Lee's gone. He, he's not any good anymore and he's not gonna, because he's, he's making too much money. Sean Lee shocked the world and took a pay cut. Ezekiel Elliott could do that because he knows at his age and how many miles on his body, what he's bringing to the table. It has nothing to do with the salary cap. It's about, you know what? We love you to death. We still want you here. And wherever you go, you're not gonna get paid that kind of money. See, and that would set up a perfect opportunity for you to make a run at keeping Tony Pollard, which uh, if you're interested in that number, what that would look like, uh, I think your best avenue is going to be franchise tagging Tony mm-hmm. Pollard. That's going to cost you about $12.6 million next year. So mm-hmm. if, if you can if you can maneuver that, if you can get Zeke to move some money or if you can get him to take a pay cut, it's doable. You, you could keep that tandem going. And uh, the 817 says Zeke has no breakaway speed. Tony Pollard does. And that's a, that's a fact at you know? this point in their careers. And here's the other thing about it. Don't even go by what I'm saying about this. I'm going to quote Jimmy Johnson for you. Jimmy Johnson on these airways with Sean and RJ explained why you have Zeke and Tony Pollard together. Ezekiel Elliott wears the defenses down and their bodies are preparing for Zeke. And then all of a sudden, Tony Pollard comes in there with a different gear. And you saw in the game today. They're on the goal line. Tony Pollard couldn't punch it in. He doesn't get the dirty yards. Somebody has to do that part. What you're liking is, if you're a Cowboys fan, is you're smart enough to utilize both. You're not saying either or. And the fact that Ezekiel Elliott looks at Tony Pollard as his little brother, his his buddy on the team, as opposed to this guy's trying to take my job. Fans think that way. Not all fans, but the few who just insist on Tony Pollard or bust. Utilize both while you can. Not the expense of one or the other. And the fact that Ezekiel Elliott says, yeah, let Tony carry the ball. I understand the big picture. Let's win the damn Super Bowl if we can. See, and it goes to the 817's point. The starting running back doesn't matter at this point. Doesn't matter. It really doesn't. Who starts the game? You know, it, exactly. they're, they're going to end up this at this point in the season. They've found this sort of symmetry in their workload that is keeping both of them on, on the field, keep, keeping both of them healthy. 
and you're getting production. You exactly. know, exactly. Tony Pollard getting you the chunk plays. He's helping you move downfield. He's helping you convert second and 13s. Mm -hmm. He's helping you get those third and sevens. And then when you get to the red zone, Zeke goes in and he finishes the job. And you know? Tony Pollard can do things catching the ball. more. I mean, he's more of a weapon catching the ball than Zeke would ever be. And Zeke, when he was a rookie, caught the ball here and there. Bottom line is Tony Pollard can do a lot of different things. And he catches the ball so well. He told me back when he was in college, he was playing tight end. He's playing tight end at Memphis and in high school. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, he played a lot of slot uh, at Memphis, too. So he's got to be respected as a receiver, you know, as a threat out of the backfield. And he's starting to show that. And that's why you just keep rolling with, you know, this split right. load. It's working. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Uh, next over under reaction. Dallas Cowboys over under reaction. The Cowboys are four and one since Dak returned in week seven. Uh, and Edwarder ESPN says uh, they're averaging an NFL best 33.8 points per game in that span. All the other teams under them, uh, the next three teams in points per game since week seven are all AFC teams. Not a single yeah, NFC something. team is clearing them in points per game. Can I break some hearts? Go for it. Shots fired to all the fans who want Cooper Rush. Yeah. That, that was such a tired conversation already, but there you go. That's all you need. I, I'm just trying to say. that that's, it's, The backup quarterback always gets a lot of love. I'm going to give Cooper Rush for being a great backup quarterback. He's going to get paid Chase Daniels kind of money. Mm -hmm. Props to him for holding it down, but he didn't win those games. The Cowboys' defense won those games. Cooper Rush didn't mess it up. Yeah, he's a... Uh... He's he, a solid he, backup quarterback. He's, and you want a guy who can step in and keep things going for a couple of games. He's not going to finish a whole season and win a bunch of games in a row for you. He's set for life now. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Good, good for I him. I am at it. I'm so happy yeah. for him because he's proven he's worth being paid as a great backup quarterback. And any team will pay him good money because he knows what he's supposed to do. He's not going to lift you, but he's not going to screw it up. And by the way, to show you that he they kind of dumbed it down for him, not – like dumbing down, but made it uncomplicated for him. He had the second fastest release in the NFL behind Tom Brady because he was not going through his progressions. He was not going through his reads. Uh, uh, this past Sunday, when Dak threw that was sixty something yard pass to uh, Tony Pollard and mm -hmm. took it to the house, da Jerry Jones even talked about it on this show, or maybe it was on KNC Masterpiece. They looked at the tape. Dak Prescott, that was his fifth choice. And he believed in it enough to do it. In other words, Dak went through his reads. The offensive line protected him enough. And Tony Pollard was able to make a big play. Because he could do that. Cooper Rush can't. So, what was your overreaction, underreaction? This will be the second to last one. The Cowboys are a top three team in the NFC. Over or underreaction? The, uh, uh, the best one would be Philadelphia. And they've proven it. The second best one, they're better than Minnesota because they proved that. We, it wasn't like the Buffalo-Minnesota game where it was you know, whoever had the ball last one and it went into overtime. Mm -hmm. This was a resounding spanking in their building. Yeah. So they're better than Minnesota. So forget the record. It's not about the best record. It's the best team. I'm going to say third, and I can believe that because quiet as it's kept, the most dangerous team in the NFC is not Tampa Bay with Tom Brady. It is San Francisco. Because they retooled San Francisco, who retooled when they got um, the running back from Carolina. Christian McCaffrey. Christian McCaffrey. Dude, don't let him get OBJ. Oh, Dude, yeah. There are, they were banged up defensively to start the year, which is why they started off kind of slow. And then, you you know, they were also had uh, uh, Trey, uh, the quarterback. They, and they, oh, Trey Lance. Trey yeah. Lance. And then they brought back Jimmy G, who knows how to quarterback it. I'm not saying he's some great quarterback, but he knows the system. Yeah. And he, he handles it. That team's a dangerous team. You do not want nobody, not just the Cowboys, nobody wants to see that team in the playoffs. So I would say number three. That's a re that's not an overreaction. I think I, it's just so weird to me that uh, a lot of people, it took a lot of people uh, this long to realize the 49ers had it like that. It took them beating the Cardinals, you know, for people to wake up. It, You know, I, I noticed it a few weeks ago. You know, as soon as they got McCaffrey, I was like, that's a dark horse team. If they're a wild card team, they're going to upset people. So that's a team that I'm definitely worried about. Final one here, Cowboys over underreaction. Uh, this is spurred actually from a text that we got. Uh, 
see the 817 uh, making mention of uh, Dax play. And we mm -hmm. saw some blemishes yesterday. So over or under reaction, Cowboys offensive turnovers are going to be the death of them this season. That is not an overreaction. They had 13 yesterday for 80-some um, yards, I think. 86 yards. For turnovers, not penalties. Oh, turnovers. My bad. Yeah. I'm thinking about penalties, too. The penalties were an issue, though. And they're, they're number two in the league this year. Last year, they were number one. Yeah. And I thought they kind of cleaned that up a little bit. But, no, I don't think – I think that's an overreaction on turnovers because they've overcome turnovers. Dak, two interceptions in each – and, by the way, Dak hadn't thrown that many interceptions until these last couple of games. Yeah. Um, And he, he's really turnover adverse, which is why he wasn't thrown into coverages last year because he – that's why Amari Cooper, even though he ran perfect routes, he wasn't thrown into coverages because he hates creating turnovers. So I don't think turnovers are going to be a problem. And it's Zeke and, and Tony Pollard are not known to fumble. See, I do think it's an overreaction as well for now. I think once you get towards, uh, you know, the January part of the season, that's when you can start to worry about it because my only fear in the turnover department is that good teams, playoff teams, aren't going to let you overcome turnovers. You know, they're going to capitalize on those mistakes like the Giants did yesterday. They, they scored off of a few turnovers, mm -hmm. you know, but obviously they didn't do anything on their own. Good teams are going to score on their own and they're going to capitalize on those turnovers and just make that gap too big to overcome. Mm -hmm. So that is when I would start to worry. Uh, but right now, as we stand on November 25th, I think it is an overreaction. <laughs>